May all living beings be happy. We chant that every morning, every night. Not that we expect that they all will be happy. After all, each person's happiness, each being's happiness, depends on his or her actions. And we have no control over that. But we should have some control over our own actions. After all, as the, the other chant says, I'm the owner of my actions. Or the Pali is even a little bit more spare. It says, I'm the owner of actions. All beings are owners of actions. It can also be translated, I'm the doer of actions. This is how we shape our lives. Or even right now, as we're meditating, we're making a choice to stay with the breath, to make the breath comfortable. We're doing that so the mind can have a good place to settle down and see its actions more clearly, in particular to see where we're creating unnecessary stress and suffering, so we can put a stop to it. And one of the ways of doing that is to remember that we're motivated by this desire not to harm anybody. We want a happiness that doesn't place any burdens on anyone else. When the Buddha listed the qualities of what helps you know whether a teaching is dharma or not, that's one of the qualities of unburdensomeness. If a particular practice makes you more burdensome, that's not really a dharma. And so we're looking for a happiness where we can just sit here and create the happiness ourselves without having to depend too much on other people. And also create a happiness that doesn't impose any hardships on them, and doesn't require that they do anything unskillful. This is a lesson we have to keep remembering over and over again, that the worst harm you can do to somebody else is to get them to act in an unskillful way, to get them to break the precepts. You harm yourself by breaking the precepts. In other words, if you kill someone else, you're harming yourself. Because by killing them, you're not necessarily sending them to a bad destination, but you're creating a bad destination for yourself. Same with stealing, illicit sex, lying, taking intoxicants. Each of us is the owner and doer of actions. So you don't want to cause people to do things that will make them suffer. At the same time, you don't want to do anything that's going to make yourself suffer. And it's a pretty radical view of our relationships. We like to think that we can make other people happy by being nice to them. And there's a certain pleasure that they get when we're nice to them, but that ne doesn't necessarily make them happy. You've probably seen many cases where you've tried your best to be nice to somebody, and they're not happy. They've got their own karma. This is especially clear when people are suffering from a mental illness, when they're getting old and sick, or the baby, just newly born. You can't talk to the baby and make things okay. You realize that on a very deep level, this is what we experience. We experience our own actions. And we do have an impact on other people, but the impact is through what we get them to do. So we want to look for happiness in a way that inspires other people to look for happiness in a way that's skillful, too. If everybody could meditate and if everybody could develop good qualities of mind, find a sense of well-being inside, okay, then there would be a possibility that all living beings would be happy.
So we have to start right here, because it's through our, our own actions that we inspire others. You can talk to people. Look at all these Dharma talks out in Dharma talks and other places on the web, and how many people are actually practicing in line with them? Who knows? It's just the talking doesn't inspire. It's the example you set. That's what inspires other people to look for happiness in the same way. So we're sitting here with our eyes closed, breathing comfortably. And John Lee tells the story of a king who had been in a battle. And after the battle was over and the troops retired, they were returning home. He came across a group of monks sitting in the forest. Everyone was very quiet. In fact, he didn't realize that there were monks there when he went first went in. There were no sounds. There were living there several hundred of them by the Buddha. He was inspired by the sight. So he told the troops to return home, and he stayed on with the monks. I don't think he became a monk himself, but he practiced. Particularly, he developed concentration based on goodwill and all the Brahma Viharas. After eight or nine years of that, then he returned home. And it was because of his example that the country in which he lived became a peaceful country, both through his instructions and exhortations and both through his personal example. The point being that the way we look for happiness is teaching a lesson to the people around us. Our society, of course, wants us to look for happiness in things or experiences that they can sell to us, the Ford experience or whatever. And look what that's doing to the world. It's placing a huge burden on other people other beings, or is the happiness that comes from looking within has a really light footprint So whether people follow our example or not. We want to make sure that we look for happiness in a skillful way. And anyone else who is inspired is welcome to join in the practice. John Sawat had a nice comment when we were starting the monastery. He says, we're not here to get anybody else. We are to get ourselves. And if other people are inspired to, to look for themselves in the same way, they're welcome to join us. That makes life here very light. We don't have to be worried about who's going to like us, who's not going to like us. Which focused within. Because this is the source of where happiness comes from, is a mind that's very clear, very still. So it can be very discerning, seeing clearly where the actions are, these movements of attention, now focusing here, now focusing there. Okay, what caused you to change focus? And when you frame things to yourself, what are the terms you use to frame them? You encounter this immediately when you're working with the breath. We start out with the assumption that the breath is the air coming in and out through the nose. And as we get more sensitive to what it's like to breathe, we begin to realize there's a whole pattern of subtle energies going through the body, many layers of subtlety in the breath. The coarse in and out breath, the subtle in and out breath that courses through the, the nerves and the blood vessels, the still breath that lies deeper within. We look for these different levels of stillness. Because when the mind has a good, solid basis in stillness, it can see its own actions a lot more clearly. So that when there's a rise or fall in the level of internal stress, you can immediately connect them with, what was the action? What did you do? What was the perception, a change in perception, change in mental fabrication? What caused the stress to go up? The letting go of what caused it to go down? And things that you didn't even realize you were doing, 
suddenly become clear. That's how you can see where you're causing unnecessary stress. A lot of it we just assume to be a natural or a necessary part of the background. But as things settle down, you, these background things begin to stand out, and you see them as choices, their actions. And then you can assess them. And you find that the less stress you're imposing on yourself, the less you're going to be imposing on other people. That old dichotomy is, are you going to go for your own awakening or you're going to work for other people's awakening? It's a false dichotomy. And going for your awakening, you're setting a good example. And that's all you can do for other people, because they have to follow the path themselves. There's nobody out there you can save. But there are people you might be able to inspire. But you first want to make your primary focus getting your own mind in order. Because at the very least, if your mind is in order, you're not placing a burden on other people. Because you're less weighed down. And when you're less weighed down, if there's something you can do to help, you do. This is why when the Buddha said when his own internal work was done, that was it. That was all the real work he had to do. Everything else was optional. This is the task right here. What are you doing right now? I was reading a letter yesterday from someone who was down on the idea that Buddhism was about self-improvement. It's not about self-improvement, it's about action improvement. Can you learn to be more skillful? Can you learn to raise your standards for what it means to be skillful? Do you want to slough along with your idea of what's good enough? Or would you rather take yourself to task and say, look, it can be better? The Buddha said that the secret to his awakening was discontentment with skillful qualities. It's interesting because we ordinarily think about Buddhism as being about contentment. And there are areas in which you are supposed to be content, content with food, clothing, shelter, as you have it. But in terms of the good qualities in the mind, the Buddha says, never rest content, because otherwise you get complacent. And complacency is the, the root of all things that are unskillful. to learn to inspire yourself, to hold yourself to higher standards. That's your best gift to yourself, as it is your best gift to everybody around you.